Dr. Fisher is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing at McMaster University and a statistical analyst in the Aging Community and Health Research Unit. Her role involves active participation in shaping the undergraduate nursing curriculum as it relates to health sciences and evidence-informed decision-making. Her goal is to ensure current content, uh, scientific integrity, accuracy, and rigor in all courses within the health science portfolio. Thank you very much for being here, and I will go ahead and give you control of the webinar and invite you to begin. Thanks, Carol, uh, and thank you for those of you who are attending today. Um, what I'm going to share with you are the results of a study we've done using CLSA data and um, looking at the relationship between multimorbidity and disability, and particularly the role of mental health in that association, and trying to understand, sort of unpack the, the potential contribution of mental health association. And first of all, just would like to uh, acknowledge the research team. So from McMaster, in, in addition to myself, Lauren Griffith, uh, David Cantors, Montana fisher Shotton, Maureen Markle-Reed, and Jenny Plough as well as Andrea Grunier from the University of Alberta. So today what I'd like to share with you, first of all, the, the purpose of the study, a little bit of background um, on what we know about different areas, so multimorbidity, disability, and mental health, not necessarily the intersect of these different areas because there hasn't actually been a lot of work on that. That's the subject of this study. But we know some things about, about each of these areas that sort of put our radar up when we're doing our work as to what we might need to control for or uh, look for associations with, what might confound relationships that we're looking at and so on. So I'll share a bit of that. And then the objectives of the study, <clears throat> some of the main hypotheses, we had a number of them, but the main ones in this work uh, are results, discussion, and what we're able to conclude from what we've done. So the purpose of the study was to uh, improve our understanding of the, really the differential impact on disability of mental health conditions coexisting with other physical chronic conditions. And so maybe to better understand that, uh, it's really a multimorbidity study, uh, so it contributes to that mm -hmm. literature, but we're focused on mental health in this work particularly. So, so for those of you who aren't actually familiar with the term multimorbidity, it's defined as having two or more chronic conditions, conditions, so we're not looking at acute conditions. Uh, and sometimes it's even defined as three or more, but I think two or more is the more common definition. It's basically having multiple chronic conditions, and however you define multiple. And then um, broadly, we're talking about physical chronic conditions like COPD, cancer, uh, coronary heart failure, arthritis, diabetes, or mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, for example. So those would all be collected as your multimorbidity. Uh, and then some background on the research in multimorbidity. So, so there has been a fair bit of work done actually at this point. It is recognized now as a global health burden. Some people actually call it a chronic condition in and of itself. Um, but it's, it's associated with a number of negative um, health and other outcomes. So disability, more disabilities associated with higher levels of multimorbidity, more mortality. Uh, more complexity in terms of clinical management or self-management, uh, and higher healthcare service use and costs. So there's been research showing those associations with morbidity. We are focused here today on disability. Uh, there's also been some work showing that mental health disorders themselves are linked with higher levels of disability in comparison to physical health conditions. And then having physical health, multimorbidity is, itself is linked to having a higher level of multiple disorders, uh, mental health disorders. So mental health, multimorbidity goes together and physical conditions, when you have them, then uh, you're more likely to have a mental health disorder. Well. Um, sorry, <laughs> there was just some background uh, noise there. We weren't sure what that was. With respect to mental health now and disability, there's been some sort of, I would call it synergistic impact of mental health research that are uh, findings that have occurred. Uh, and they're all coming, uh, not all, but in Quinons is one, one author, Anna Quinons, she's from Europe, I believe, but she has done a lot of work in multimorbidity and disability. So some of her work is in, in particular pointing to 
a sort of synergistic, I guess, impact of mental health. So, for example, um, she has found that disease and her, her research team, disease clusters that include depression are associated with higher disability compared to disease clusters that include only physical health conditions. Um, she also did some work where she looked at the most prevalent disease clusters and limited that to the top 14 clusters, of which one, and only one of them, actually included a mental health um, condition. It was depressive symptoms. And depressive symptoms combined with hypertension and arthritis, although they were ranked 11th out of 14th in terms of prevalence, so not the most prevalent condition, it actually was associated with the highest level of disability. So there's that finding out there. Again, it's sort of suggesting there's something about mental health that elevates uh, disability relative to other conditions. Then there's also been some work where people look at index conditions. So these are one-off studies, arthritis, COPD, diabetes, where, again, the finding has been that when those index conditions are combined with a mental health condition, typically it's depression, that the disability is higher for those um, combinations of conditions than those index conditions combined with either physical, other physical conditions or on their own. So, again, pointing, suggesting there's something unique about mental health that we should be looking at. And, and then also some things we faced in this study and multimorbidity research studies in general face, uh, there, there's a lot of um, other things that associations and factors that we need to take into account. So studies on multimorbidity, disability, and mental health um, have also shown associations with sociodemographic factors. So multimorbidity and disability, they both increase with age, and we know that, and have shown that repeatedly. Multimorbidity and disability are higher in women, are higher in lower SES or socioeconomic groups, minority populations. Mental health conditions are higher in women. So, so there's we need to pay attention to some of the sociodemographic factors because they may be confounding uh, associations that we're looking at. Excuse me, can we just ask people on the that are on the phone listening to to mute their phones? While, they're, while we're doing the presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, and so another complication with multimorbidity research is the lists that are used to identify whether people actually have multimorbidity. So they vary widely in terms of the conditions that are actually included on that list, how many and, and what types. And then, in particular, mental health conditions are quite often not included on those lists at all because it's difficult to actually get information on mental health conditions. So uh, in administrative data or self-report for a variety of reasons. So that information often isn't available, and so mental health hasn't been within multimorbidity studies looked at very much. And then finally, disease clusters. We had intended in this work to do a fair bit more on clusters of diseases, but it is very hard to do, and there are a number of things, especially when you have a large list of chronic conditions, and we did have a large list. So that sort of exponentially increases the clusters of conditions that you have and look at. So, so you have to limit those. Well, there's a few problems. You have to limit the number of conditions you look at effectively, and, and so you start looking at the most prevalent ones or just dyads, like a pairing of conditions, and stop there. And then you also are running into issues with trying to associate people or link people with clusters uniquely, and that requires a lot, a lot of assumptions that aren't necessarily going to hold. So it's been hard to actually do disease clustering research fully. Usually we pick and choose the clusters we look at, so it's a partial picture of associations that we're actually seeing. So now to this study, what, what, uh, what we were really doing um, in terms of our specific objectives, we want, first of all, one is to determine the rate of physical disability and mental disorders that were in the CLSA baseline data set and then also to see what mental health conditions clustered with in terms of what other physical conditions uh, they, they were clustering with. Then we wanted to look at the association between multimorbidity and disability and really try to isolate the, the role of mental health in that association. And then finally to uh, try to investigate age, sex, and some of the other sociodemographic factors that we know are also involved in the relationships between disability and multimorbidity and, and what we should be controlling for and what associations might be modified by those factors. 
And in terms of hypotheses, we had quite a few, but, but the main ones in this work, there was one relating to disability and then one to the clustering. So in terms of disability, this first hypothesis was that multimorbidity combinations that included mental health conditions would be associated with higher levels of disability compared to combinations of disease clusters that included only physical conditions. And uh, that we, we actually were looking at or thinking this would be true for each level of multimorbidity. So leveling of multimorbidity in our case was measured by count of chronic conditions. So what we were thinking is if we looked at each level or each count, within the count we would still see a sort of differential impact of mental health conditions on disability versus uh, people that don't have mental health conditions. So that was one hypothesis. And then in terms of clustering, um, what we we were expecting to see is that mental health conditions would cluster with more symptomatic conditions like arthritis, COPD, stomach bowel disorders, and that might help us to understand the link with disability. So, and, and there's been some research that has actually shown these connections. So when mental health is clustered, it has clustered with particularly arthritis um, and COPD, for example. So we were expecting to see that here as well. In terms of the data, that was used in the study, uh, we were looking at baseline CLSA data, and there were 51,000, slightly over 51,000 people in the cohort. These were community dwelling Canadians aged 45 to 85, and the data were obtained through either in-person or um, computer-assisted telephone interviews. So for those of you familiar with the CLSA data, this, this data set included both the tracking and comprehensive cohorts. Measures uh, that were used in the study, so our outcome was disability, and that was a dichotomous measure. So uh, um, if a person reported any uh, limitation, and there were 14 either basic or instrumental ADLs, that activities of daily living, and if they reported any of those 14, then they had a disability versus didn't, if they didn't uh, self-report any of those limitations. And these items that were, uh, the actual limitations came from the ORS instrument, for those of you that are familiar with that, um, <coughs> that instrument. The multimorbidity, as I mentioned, was captured by number of chronic conditions. So people, and, and chronic here was that you had a condition for at least six months, six months, and then participants were asked, has a doctor ever told you that you have, and were asked a number, uh, for a number of different chronic conditions, which I'll mention in a moment. And mental health specifically here was mood and anxiety self-reported in the, among the chronic conditions that I mentioned in point two above. So, so mood and anxiety we pulled out and that was how we measured having a mental health condition. Um, we also, though, did some work. We added to that. So, so in addition to self-reported mood or anxiety, we actually captured depressive symptoms and uh, because of CESD instrument was also uh, captured in the CLSA data, so those people that scored 10 or more on the CESD instrument were also um, in another, an another analysis added to the cohort of people with self-reported he mental health conditions. And so we looked at mental health with that broader composite definition. And the reason for doing that is, again, mental health is often underreported or underdiagnosed, so um, we thought we would possibly be capturing, we certainly would be capturing more people with depressive symptoms included as a measure of mental health, but also um, trying to capture people who mo more than likely would have depression but may, may not even know it, um, and the doctor hasn't picked it up either. So uh, that we did that composite work as well. And just so you can have a look at all of the conditions, so we had quite a large number of chronic conditions that were used in measuring multimorbidity for this data set. And uh, this, is, this is showing you um, the prevalence uh, for the 51,000 and some odd people um, from high to low. And again, even this list is actually um, a grouping of other, of more um, conditions that were captured. So for example, arthritis is both osteo and rheumatoid arthritis captured together here. Thyroid is hyper, hypo. So, so heart condition, there were a number of heart conditions grouped together under here. So this is actually um, itself a grouping of chronic conditions. And methods, what we actually did, so we, we actually did this work in phases. So phase one was looking at disability prevalence for people with and without mental health conditions. 
And, and what we were doing is actually comparing people at the same multimorbidity level, so at the same number of chronic conditions level, those with and without a mental health condition, and looking at the, uh, whether there was a difference in disability prevalence between those two groups, holding uh, multimorbidity constant. And then we looked at some stratified analyses by age and sex. We also used logistic regression to estimate the odds of disability for people with and without a mental health condition. So the independent variable there was number of chronic conditions, and with the reference category being zero chronic conditions, and that was true in all the models. The dependent variable was disability, yes, you have it or no, you don't. And um, running these models separately for people that had mental health as part of their multimorbidity versus didn't. And then again, those models we first ran unadjusted and then adjusted for sociodemographic factors that looked like they should be kept, um, at least controlled for. Um, in terms of the association between multimorbidity and disability. And then in phase two, we captured more mental health conditions by also including, like using this composite measure of depressive symptoms plus self-reported depression or self-reported, really that should say mood or anxiety um, there. And then disability, we also looked at disability, the, the main analysis, the phase one analysis, disability was IEDL and ADL either. Um, but then we, in phase two, we actually separated them out because we, we just weren't sure if we would see a difference. Um, <clears throat> IADLs are more cognitive and they're more normally more highly prevalent and, and often are emerge earlier than ADLs. So there are these differences and we weren't sure what that meant for our analysis, so we actually looked at them separately. And then phase three was our factor analysis to look at um, multimorbidity clusters and what physical conditions mental health was clustering with. And there was also this uh, one variable that we thought, well, we could actually see uh, if there was a mental health connection, and that was a social participation variable. So CLSA captures a variable that asks whether you, were, you, were, whether ha you had a health condition that restricted social participation. So we could actually stratify that by those with and without mental health conditions to see whether um, mental health might be affecting social participation. So we looked at that too. So our first set of results for phase one, um, so 51% of the, the cohort were female and 20% had a mood or anxiety disorder. Um, we also saw that overall multimorbidity was, so people had 2.2 um, chronic conditions of which if you were, it, it, it was, then the actual average was higher if you had a mood or anxiety disorder than if you didn't. So. Um, so we are seeing what, what has also been seen in the literature, that if you have a physical condition, you're also more likely to have a mood or anxiety disorder as well. Um, and then just here, here we just looked at some of the main demographic um, variables and we stratified. So we looked at all participants, all 51,000, and then stratified, uh, did a stratified analysis. Those with mood or anxiety, that's the center column versus those without mood or anxiety, the column on the right. And here again, you do start to see some, some of the differential um, influence of mental health right off the bat. So, so you see sex differences. So women overall in the cohort were 51%, but when we look at 51% of the cohort, but when we look at mood or those with mood or anxiety versus without, women are 63% of those with mood or anxiety and 48% with, uh, without. So more women than men have mood or anxiety disorders. Um, with respect to age, what we see there is that the younger um, age groups, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, um, more of those have mood or anxiety relative to the overall um, cohort. And so mood or anxiety are more common in the younger age groups relative to the older age groups. Um, with respect to the other physical chronic conditions, the, the most common ones are shown here. The most prevalent ones arthritis, eye conditions, um, hypertension or high blood pressure, diabetes, and respiratory. For all people that, for people that had any of those, mood or anxiety is more common um, for all of those conditions. So you're more likely to have a mood or anxiety disorder if you also have these physical chronic conditions. So we saw that um, in terms of number of chronic conditions. You can see here that at the higher levels, three, four, and five plus, more people 
um, have a mood or anxiety disorder among that group than uh, at the lower chronic condition, uh, number of chronic condition levels. And then social participation. So that was that variable I mentioned earlier. Was there a health restriction that, that uh, limited you in terms of your social participation? So overall, 7.6% of the cohort reported that there was a health condition that limited participation. But within those with a mood or anxiety, 14% reporting a limitation as versus 5.9% for those that don't have mood or disorder, mood or anxiety. And uh, with limitations, the, the last row there, 10% overall reported having a limitation, ADL or IADL, but within the mood or anxiety group, that was 17% as versus 8%. So there you're seeing right off the bat some, some differences among those with and without mood or anxiety. And here now we're looking at disability prevalence. So that center, bigger figure, figure one, is actually everyone combined um, with the y-axis being the percentage uh, or prevalence of disability and the x-axis being number of chronic conditions. So you certainly see that as chronic conditions increase from one, two, three, up to five plus, that disability prevalence increases overall. And then when you look at the blue versus gray, you're comparing the mood to the not mood, uh, people with a mood disorder, mood or anxiety versus not, at each of those levels. So there seems to be, um, when you look overall, for some of the levels, there seems to be a bit of a difference, a higher prevalence of disability when you have a mood disorder versus don't. So for example, if you look at level two, level four, level five plus, you see that the blue bar is higher than the gray, which suggests that there is a disability is associated with a higher prevalence for those levels. And then when you break it down into women and men, so the figures on the right, um, a few things you can see from that. So that differentiation between mood and not mood for men, the bottom figure, doesn't seem to be there until you get to the five plus. It's pretty well the same prevalence at each level of multimorbidity, whether you have a mood or disorder or not. But with women, you're seeing more of a separation there, uh, higher disability with mood, those with mood versus without, and higher disability in women compared to men really at each level of multimorbidity. So you're seeing all of that. So there are sex differences here in relation to disability, in relation to mood, and they're coming out in that figure, those, or those figures. And then also we know that age is a factor. So it's not just accounting for sex, but also looking at age differences. So here you've got age and sex captured and looking at disability prevalence. And what you see are, again, higher levels of disability in women than men at each of the age groups and quite a difference um, between those in terms of disability prevalence for those with mood versus without mood. Um, disorders at each of the age levels, and for women and men. But we also know this, that number of chronic conditions and age are highly correlated with one another. So as you, so, so this is just showing you that, that, so there's both age and number of chronic conditions happening here in this association, and we really need to <clears throat> Teach, need to capture or separate both, stratify by both to really better understand what's going on. So this is just showing that number of chronic conditions at each of the age groups very clearly is associated with um, age. And yes, you're seeing that mood, uh, mood versus not mood distinction with, with, with number of chronic conditions being higher for those with mood versus not mood. But so it, this is really just now thinking, okay, age and multimorbidity, we really would like to control for both and need to control for both to understand what's going on. And that's what we did here. So we actually stratified by both, uh, or captured age separately and then age groups separately and then uh, number of chronic conditions within and looking at the prevalence of disability. So, so you're seeing generally here that there's an increase in the level of multimorbidity um, with, or a, the increase in the level of disability with multimorbidity, and especially when you get to the older age groups. So, so there's a gradient, so with the 65 to 74, 75 to 85, in terms of going from zero to, to five plus in both the 65 
uh, to 74 and 75 to 85. So disability is increasing with number of chronic conditions in both of those age groups. It's a little less of a gradient uh, in the younger group, 45 to 54 especially, it's not as much of a gradient. 55 to 64 is somewhat of one, but it's really distinct when you get to the older ages. And then there's some evidence here that disability is increasing with age. So if you actually, for, for a given level of multimorbidity, so if you actually compare the bars, it's hard to see, I think, in this figure, but if you compare 0, 1, 2 chronic conditions and you then compare those bars across each of the age groups, there's, there is a slight increase in them over the ages. So, so we can see, uh, we have a bit of a window into what's going on and then what with respect to disability prevalence. And so where we went from there is actually to run the logistic regression models um, to actually capture the odds of disability. And again, to um, hear these odds that we're showing you are compared to people with zero chronic conditions. And we're comparing those with a mood or anxiety disorder to those without at each level of multimorbidity. And so here you can see that there does appear to be uh, slightly higher disability odds uh, among those with a mood or anxiety. So comparing the blue dots to the, the dark blue dots, light blue to dark blue, all the way along, they appear higher. Um, the, the light blue dots, those are the odds of those with odds of disability among those with a mood or anxiety disorder. So you are seeing that here. The problem, though, being that age is confounding. Uh, some of what we're seeing, we know that because younger people have mood and disorder, but they have less disability, so we know that it's important to actually control for age. So we did, that's an unadjusted model you're looking at here. Here's the logistic um, re regression results when we actually control for age. So it's included as a covariate in the model. And once we do that, we can see a more significant difference between the light blue and the dark blue dots at each level of, um, or number of chronic conditions, level of multimorbidity. Uh, there's some overlap in the confidence intervals at some of the levels of multimorbidity. Um, for example, levels one, three, and four, there's some overlap. There's actually no overlap with level two or five plus. Um, so that's when we just adjust for age. And I'm not showing you all these results because this would go on for a long time, but we did quite a few stratified analyses um, looking at other, other sociodemographic variables and whether we were seeing any difference in the association between multimorbidity and mood versus not mood and disability for other factors. So age and sex we, we, we've looked at, but we also looked at income and education, uh, living alone, um, social support, and, and I think that, was that it, David, pretty much, those ones? And so we did look at all of this, and we, we saw it, what that all suggested was age, sex, and education at the end of the day seemed to show the strongest relationships with disabilities. So we wanted to be sure in our work from this point on that we at least adjusted for those covariates in the models. <clears throat> so here is that the result for when we do actually adjust for age, sex, and education. And again, it's not really changing the overall result. Um, that we had seen, which is slightly higher disability levels for those with mood versus without at each of the levels of multimorbidity. Um, so that looks a lot like what we were looking at when we adjusted for age alone. Now, getting into phase two. So this is now considering um, other people, so the underreporting of, of mood and anxiety disorders, so considering the composite measure of CESD, those people that scored 10 or more on that instrument, in addition to those that reported self-reported mood or anxiety, and we re-ran the models with that, considered to be mental health, uh, having mental health conditions. And so what you see here is now a, a, a clear separation, actually, um, between those the disability levels for those with a mood versus without at each level of number of chronic conditions. And when you actually look at the ORs and the confidence intervals, what you see is the ORs are higher here than they were for phase one um, for the mental, those with mental health, higher in, at all levels of multimorbidity, and the confidence intervals now do not overlap at all uh, for any level. So that's what happened when we actually broadened uh, the mental health to include depressive symptoms. We're seeing more clearly here, uh, higher disability levels with those that have mood or anxiety defined that way. 
And that's actually a model that's adjusted for age, sex, and education as well, those results. And then the other thing we did in phase two was actually look at limitations separately. So ADL and IADL examined separately. So here are the results for ADL only. And so it's, it, it, this, this looks a lot like the phase one results, actually. So um, very much like it. And in fact, the only real difference is the confidence intervals are tighter here. Um, and then they were when you compare this to phase one results. So, so it looks a lot like phase one with tighter confidence intervals around um, both those with mood and without. And that's as opposed to this one, which is looking at IADLs only and in an adjusted model like before. But here what you're seeing is more overlap in the confidence intervals, more variance actually, especially with those with a mood or anxiety disorder. Well, right, so that so that's that's why you have wider confidence intervals is fewer people have IADL. That's what the analyst is saying, <laughs> David, who's here too. Yeah, and I would expect that. So that's the reason for the wider confidence interval. Um, okay, and then phase three was actually looking at disease clustering. So here the interest was in, in just what, what, are, what are the multimorbidity clusters, but then where does mental health land? What does it cluster with? And in, in the research to date, it sometimes is clustered with some of the conditions I mentioned earlier, arthritis and uh, COPD, but there are other studies that actually show that it's on its own completely. So we weren't sure what this is going to look like for our data set. But here are the results of clustering. So this is the rotated factor analysis results, which came out suggesting there were four, uh, four factors or four disease clusters. The one that's familiar and comes out in almost every study is the cardiometabolic one, which includes your hypertension, diabetes, heart conditions, stroke. Um, our second factor was where mood actually ended up, mood and anxiety disorders, which were clustering with bowel disorders, migraine, intestinal, intestinal or stomach ulcers, and respiratory conditions. Um, and then there was a, a miscellaneous one, arthritis ended up in actually that, that uh, factor or that disease cluster with osteoporosis, eye conditions, and thyroid. Sorry. And then finally there was a neurological um, factor which was UTI combined with other neurological conditions was the last factor. So, so here we actually see mood combining with some of the things we expected, uh, bowel, migraine, um, stomach disorders, respiratory conditions, some of the literature has pointed to mood or anxiety combining with those. Uh, we expected arthritis in that group but didn't see that and, and UTI we would have expected too. However, what we can notice about those two conditions if we look at the, the middle column is the factor loadings were actually higher for arthritis and UTI with respect to that second um, condition where mood fell as versus any of the other conditions in that column. So, so there, are, there is some association there of those other expected conditions with that uh, second factor where mood, mood fell. And then finally, looking at social participation, that, that other variable we had and whether health conditions were limiting your social participation, we did look at that as giving us some sort of signal about whether mental health would, would actually impact social participation. And what we see here are the results of looking at that, just, just briefly. Um, so you're seeing that for both men and women, uh, you're, there's a, a, there is a difference between those reporting social participation restriction for those that do have a mood or anxiety disorder versus don't across all age groups and both sexes. So we are seeing, again, this differential impact of mood and anxiety with respect to reporting a social participation restriction. And here we could benefit, I think, a bit by unpacking this a little bit more and controlling for a number of chronic conditions, but I don't think it would change this um, main association that we're seeing that mood or anxiety is uh, differentially impacting uh, or associated with higher social participation restrictions. So to, to sort of wrap up, what have we seen and found in this study? A few things, so mood or anxiety disorders are more prevalent in younger age groups and in women. Um, they cluster, mood or anxiety disorders appear to cluster with 
highly symptomatic physical conditions, respiratory, migraine, and bowel and intestinal in this data set were what we actually saw it cluster with. Uh, disability is higher in women than men at all levels of multimorbidity. Uh, the prevalence of disability increases with the level of multimorbidity. And at a given level of multimorbidity, so number of chronic conditions, the prevalence of disability is, is higher among those with mental health disorders compared to those without. And that was true even when we adjusted for the sociodemographic variables that also might have been confounding that association. Uh, for men and women in all age groups, those with mental health disorders were also more likely to report social participation restrictions due to health compared to those without. Then the one thing we just wanted to, to, to point out, we were actually expecting, I think, more of a difference um, in terms of disability prevalence for those with mental health conditions versus without. And we've actually seen some work, uh, recent work at some of the conferences we've been to where, where it does seem to be um, uh, more of a difference than we actually saw in this work. And we're, reckon we're trying to understand that a little bit better. And one thing we have noticed um, <clears throat> that is in some of the work we've seen at conferences is actually the comparison when you're comparing those with a mood or anxiety disorder to those without. It isn't always controlled for the number of level, number of chronic conditions. So quite often the work doesn't control for that. So what they'll do is they'll um, take number of chronic condi physical chronic conditions and then add a, a mental health condition to that and then notice that the disability or, or if it's health services has increased when you add a mental health condition. But the problem with doing it that way is you've also added a condition in and of itself, and we know that there's a very clear relationship between many outcomes, health services, disability, and just strictly number of chronic conditions. So that's why in, in this work we've controlled for number of chronic conditions. But actually we didn't start out that way, <laughs> and this figure is actually showing you where we started which was sort of the same place everyone else started. So, for example, when you look at this figure, you see that those with mood, this is our original bar chart, um, but you see that those with, uh, in the light blue are the, those with mood or anxiety and compared to the dark blue, those without. And what we, we did here is the zero, for example, was the, the dark blue was no chronic conditions and the light blue was having a mood or anxiety disorder. And where it says one, that was one physical condition versus a physical condition with a mood or anxiety. So we really, the one is actually comparing two to one, and three is comparing three to two, and so on. So you're not actually holding constant the number of chronic conditions. And so that's why we here, we saw quite a significant difference between uh, the prevalence of disability for those with and without mood. But that's when, after we thought about this a little bit more, we started controlling for number of chronic conditions. And uh, that then brought things down a bit in terms of the difference. <clears throat> Some limitations that uh, we should acknowledge here are that relatively few CLSA participants actually reported ADL and IADL limitations. This is a fairly healthy um, group. It also starts at 45, so we're not looking at older adults, and we didn't restrict the analysis to that. Um, but they're, they're a community-dwelling, relatively healthy population at this point. So we're not seeing, we only had 10% of this population actually reporting an ADL or IADL. And the work's not cross-sectional. We're looking at baselines, so we can't make causality claims from what we're seeing here. Um, and also we ran into, especially when we started stratifying um, for sociodemographic factors and, and uh, number of chronic conditions and mental health, not mental health, we're stratifying by many different ways and creating small cell sizes, and that can become difficult. So we had to sort of rein ourselves in there in terms of how many stratifications we did because the cell sizes were getting very small. Um, and then multimorbidity itself, we're actually measuring it as a count of chronic conditions, but we know that that needs some unpacking. So we know that if you had two chronic conditions, for example, we wouldn't expect your disability level to be the same if it was anxiety and COPD versus anxiety and hypertension. So you'd have two either way chronic conditions, but we would expect that um, disability might be different for those scenarios. So we're not getting into the types of physical conditions and, and getting specific about those combinations, but that's there too. And, and so there's more work needs to be done to actually understand, I think, mental health in relation to specific conditions that you are pairing with. 
So in, in terms of what we are able to conclude from what we've done, these results suggest that, we, that the presence of mental health disorders increases the level of disability and decreases social activity at all levels of multimorbidity measured as a count with uh, potentially stronger effects in women compared to men. And that's it. So not sure if we have questions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a really great presentation. Um, I'll open it up now to questions. Uh, as a reminder, muting remains on, but you enter your questions into the chat window at the bottom right corner of the WebEx window, and I'll read it out, and um, we'll go ahead and have a discussion. So we do have a first question from, um, would you comment more on the inclusion criteria for the chronic conditions? Did you apply the most prevalence, prevalence conditions? I have seen high blood pressure, 38% to neurologic conditions, 2%. There, is there any reason why you keep more than 2%? Okay, scroll down here, you can read. If you open this up, you can read the question for yourself. Okay. Comments. Any more any comments on the inclusion criteria for the chronic condition? So binning the chronic condition? <clears throat> right. So so we accepted all um, chronic conditions. We didn't actually exclude. Okay. So we so we yeah we did take out. Is that all we excluded though? Okay, so, so the analyst is here saying we took out anything less than 1%, so there are some conditions that are missing here, and we did take out multiple sclerosis, and again, that was one that very few people reported. So we did take out those, but otherwise left in the rest. Um, so if you have a follow-up question on top of that, feel free to go ahead and type it in. We'll try to keep that conversation going. Uh, we ha I have um, Dr. Lauren Griffiths. Uh, from HEI McMaster here in the room with us, and she has a couple of questions. Uh, you say that different types of uh, mental health conditions are less often considered in studies of multiple morbidity. Uh, how might focusing on these two conditions impact our results? So as opposed to schizophrenia and bipolar, is that weird? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> only two. Only mood and focusing on only two. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the, the reason for looking at mood and anxiety here were they were the ones captured most frequently in, um, in uh, studies where mental health has been used in, in multimorbidity. So that's in part our focus. They're also probably much more frequent than bipolar and schizophrenia. So I think you'd run into small sample sizes. There are small cell sizes when you started including those conditions too. Uh, and I don't know what they look like. Like I was looking at some of the literature more recently, um, that, reviewing it again, and I've even noticed people will take depressive symptoms, but they won't take some of the other conditions like bipolar. So it's really been a, a major focus on mood and anxiety as opposed to some of these other um, mental health conditions that are less frequent and I think more extreme in many cases. But that extremity might argue that those would have big effects. They, so. they might. In a small group of people, they might, though, yeah. yeah. So should we? <laughs> I, I think the first thing we'd have to look at is whether, you know, how many people actually reported those. Um, and I, I, we were trying here to create results that we could compare with the broader literature, which would be then the focus on mood and anxiety, I would say. So we have a question from Maya Lynn Lee Dehu. Why do you think it was more common for mood disorders in younger age groups? How can this influence how we focus our efforts and care for these younger age groups? It's a great mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Uh, I, I would imagine the younger age groups, younger here, meaning the 45 to 64, are probably the, the, they're the working population. They have pa parents that are, um, that are elderly and taking care of those those people as well. So they're probably caregivers, or many of them might be caregivers. And so they're stressed in that regard. And I think it's likely reflecting that. You do see um, in healthy populations that uh, relationships of lower depression levels with age. So that's not uncommon in healthy populations. When you look at 
uh, chronically ill ones, those people that have other conditions like diabetes or COPD, that's not the case. But I think in a general population like we're looking at here, uh, actually it's a, it's a lower, lower prevalence for the older age groups and that's consistent with the broader literature. So, but then again, that, that still leaves the what can we do about this or what should we be doing about this. Um, yeah, I don't know, David, do you have a comment on that? This might fit into a question that I had as well, which is, um, did you look at the differences between teasing out anxiety versus depression? No, we didn't. And, and that might might change with age quite a quite mm -hmm. a bit and make recommendations for each of those age groups different for those connections. I think again it's sizes. The <laughs> sizes of people when you start when you only have twenty percent overall um, and then you start separating into those with mood and, and versus anxiety and pulling them out, you might run into small sample sizes again. But a, a, ADL and IADL, having said that, ran into the same problem. Yeah. So we might, that might be worth us separating and looking at that, but I, I think. I can see that. And, and it, like I say, small numbers, you run into them many times throughout these stratified analyses. That would be another example, but it might pull out a difference. For, particularly for the age, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, Monica has a question. I'm always curious about the difference in women versus men and mental health conditions. Do you feel there is an element of lack of reporting by men, thereby skewing the results? And that I, I have a question there too. That said, you know, the, the the change in your model when you include depressive symptoms, the C E S D, you could see that that effect on men becoming more like mm -hmm. women. Right, so because of the self-reporting, it, it could very well reflect that. Um, I mean, that's the perennial question. In, in, in every study, it seems, you know, you, not every, but almost, many, many studies, women have higher mental health conditions than men, and they go to the doctor more frequently than men normally, or higher uses of health service use than men, so, so that may all go together as to why women report more than men. And maybe the CESD, that's what I was thinking originally, was the CESD may be adjusting for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's, I, I, I do think it's under-reporting. It's probably under-reported in both groups, um, but perhaps more so in men. Okay. Uh, a couple more, a couple more questions. We have time for uh, Connie Morano asked, would arthritis count only once for multiple sites of arthritic pain? Knees, hands, elbow, back. I asked because of the context, compound effect of pain. And my add-on question is, can you review the, the cluster analysis that did not put an arthritis for the symptomatic? So good. Arthritis counts only once for multiple sites. Yes. yes. Arthritis would have counted once for multiple sites. Yeah. Because we did have we did have information on um, arthritis separately by location, but we, we would have counted it once here. Because of the compound effect. Yeah, and and uh, yeah. Okay. Same with you know, and same with heart conditions. There's a lot of there's more than one thing in there, and I wonder though, I, I think maybe what I'm thinking when I'm seeing that question is, if we were to separate them out, would we see a connection? Count them um, as more than one. Yeah, would we then see a connection with mood and anxiety like we were expecting to see? No, I think that's probably a valid point. Mm -hmm. All right, one, maybe one last question here. Um, are older people uh, with mental health is issues less likely to be able to participate in the CLSA, po possibly causing a survivor cohort effect, leading to um, some of the age uh, associations that we're looking at? Hmm. That's a better <laughs> that's a better question for our CLSA people here. From participation rates, where did you have did you see that? What we what we have done is we have come compared the um, CLSA data on a number of chronic conditions with, say, data that we have from other um, stats can surveys or from the census. 
and we found fairly similar results with many of the chronic conditions um, where the CLSA would potentially differ, not necessarily on depression, but certainly on um, cognition because people had to be able to pro pro provide data on their own. Um, we did not have proxies for CLSA right. at baseline, and they had to be able to sign their own um, uh, written consent. So there were some differences, but generally when we when we compared them, the, our population to the general population of Canada in that area that, or in that age range that met our inclusion criteria, it was fairly similar. Okay. And that, again, that was Dr. Lauren Griffiths is here in the room <laughs> and that included uh, general mental health as well as uh, depression, I believe, was, was in that analysis, so diagnosed by depression. All right, one last kind of uh, overall question. Do you have any recommendations based on your work for researchers studying multimorbidity? Any future directions or? Go after mental health. <laughs> I really do think, I mean, we do, and it's a real focal point for a lot of our intervention studies uh, that I, I I participate in a lot of intervention studies in our research unit. And mental health, we, we study diabetes and we study stroke, but mental health is a, a really significant uh, element of our interventions, even though they're people with stroke and people with diabetes. So um, I, think, I think it's capturing mental health and, and if you've got available CESD or instruments like that to actually be able to tap into feelings and perceptions and emotions, that don't get diagnosed. <laughs> it's a really important thing to, to be able to capture. So some of this work, um, the work by Garen, for example, he, a he actually chose not to use self-reported depression and instead ran an instrument and captured depressive symptoms, and that was the mental health measure. So I think some people are trying to do that because they recognize that self-report is um, tough to get an act, and even admin data, it's tough to get uh, mental health conditions. Well, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I'd like to thank you again for giving us such a great presentation. We appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So uh, if we can advance the slide, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is June 5th, 2019. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, further information, and details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey located under the polling option. If you have any questions or concerns that we can help you with, write us in the chat box and we can help you out. Uh, thank you for uh, filling out the, the poll. We appreciate uh, you helping us focus uh, our future uh, webinar series. And reminder, the CLNA, C, CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar and we invite you to follow us on Twitter. Please go to our CLSA website to register for our next webinar series uh, presentation coming up soon. Um, and this slide is showing uh, our next month's uh, CLSA webinar, the 2019 update on the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, what's new and what's next for Canada's research, national research platform on health and aging, where we'll, we'll have Dr. Parminder Aina, the lead PAI of the CLSA, and Dr. Yav Jonet, Scientific Director of CIHR Institute of Aging, here talking about the CLSA platform. So that should be very exciting. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation.